are you on, my people? What side are you on? We are the freedom side. What side are you on, my people? What side are you on? We are the freedom side. What side are you on, my people? What side are you on? We are the freedom side. Welcome to Heal DC. This is Joni, and hopefully Chuck Hicks is on with us. Good morning, Chuck. Not sure if he's on, but we are very excited to have with us for the hour today uh, an inspiring organization that some of you may not have heard of yet, Harriet's Wildest Dreams. And we have one of the co-conductors of Harriet's Wildest Dreams uh, on with us. She's going to uh, first, explain what Harry Wildest Dreams is, and uh, we're going to be talking a lot today about an upcoming uh, teaching that they're doing on the D.C. crime bill. We will be joined later in the hour uh, by another one of the co-conductors, uh, Nene Taylor. Uh, but let me first welcome, uh, well, let me also mention that we have a new member of our Heal D.C. team that will be on the phone with us today as well, Kimon McIver Williams, uh, and she may jump in later as well. Um, but I'll just say, I'll just start out, Harriet Wildest Dreams is a Black-led abolitionist, defense hub centering Black lives most at risk for D.C. state-sanctioned violence. And uh, they do quite a bit. I'm very... Uh, proud of them. I'm very encouraged by the work they're doing. So with that said, um, welcome, Frankie. Hello, hello, Joni. It's <laughs> wonderful to be here on today. Good morning. Hey, good morning to you. And uh, give, your, you, uh, give the audience an idea, first of all, of who you are yeah. and why you are committed to Harriet's Wildest Dreams as a co-conductor. I am actually a program manager with, with Harriet's Wildest Dreams, and I'm a lead organizer of the Ida B. Free Pillar, which is our legal defense pillar. My name is Frankie Sebron. I am a third, gener a third generation Washingtonian. I'm DC through and through, baby. Um, I'm a mother of two. <laughs> I'm a former teacher. Um, and, you know, something just clicked on for me, Joni, um, at the height of the pandemic. And I was like, we have to fight um, these in injustices at a more systemic level. And I left the classroom, I went into the community, and I never looked back. And I've been in, in community ever since. And I'm proud to call HWD, Harry's Wildest Dreams, my political home and encourage all of the, the listeners out there, if you are looking for um a Black-led grassroots organization who is truly doing the work, um, HWD is the place for you. Um, so, yeah, come come see about us. Yes, and we're going to talk more about how folks can do that. But let's first of all go over the different, um, I don't know what you call them, action teams, uh, the different pillars that you have. You started talking about it, but just kind of go through, I think there are three or four different yeah. groups that are leading um, this work. Absolutely. So we so have, tell three, us what mm -hmm. yeah, we have three different pillars that are um, really led in the spirit of our ancestors. Each of our, each of our pillars is named after a freedom fighter who really 
embodies the work that we still do today. Our Harriet's Re- Responders Pillar is all about um, co- community defense. So think mass protests. Think um, like things that are happening right now with the with the curfew, we have folks on the ground really responding to the things that are happening in our communities in real time. Um, and so that's a little a little bit about Harriet's responders. That also in 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 includes our safety squad. And the safety squad is a coalition of different organizations who really believe in an alternative to safety. Um, The things that we have right now are tried and true to fail. The carceral system, police, courts, judges, those things don't keep us safe. The the things that actually keep us safe is being outside, knowing our neighbors, knowing our people, um, and really being in deep community with each other. Um, And that's what Harriet's re- Harriet's responder strives to do. So that's one that's one aspect of the work. Then we also have our legal defense pillar, which is my pillar called the Ida B. Free Pillar. And so I want you to think all things court watch. Police are just the entry point to the carceral system. That's just how things start. But things continue when people go in front of these judges. So I I want you to think about the judges, the prosecutors, the bailiffs, anybody who is interacting with that loved one who has to go into that courtroom. Those are the people that we have eyes on through our Court Watch DC program. Um, it's a little bit about our legal defense pillar. And then we have our Ella's Emancipators. And so what this teaching at the end of the month is really going to focus on is what do we need the public to know about these crime bills in order to fight back against them? And that's all p- what we call political education. And that falls under our Ellis pillar. So lots of good work happening over at Harriet's Wildest Dreams um, and very expansive work. There's ways for everybody to get involved. And I bet it must be named after Ella Baker. Is that right? It is named after Uh, Ella Baker. Absolutely. (laughs) Tell, Tell our listeners who may not know who Ella Baker was. Yes. So Ella Baker was a just a a a strategist, a political or a political organizer. Like this, she made the blueprint for what it means to organize, getting our people on the ground, mobilizing our people to really like each one teach one. And so she's just really pivotal um, in what we know as modern day organizing. Absolutely. And she is one of the people that are um, is responsible for uh, inspiring SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee folks always talk about Ella Baker. And for people who don't know who Ida B. Wells is, tell us who she was and why she is uh, named for your, um, is that the legal pillar? Yeah. So Ida B. Wells led an anti an anti an anti lynching campaign um in the 1800s no one really knew what was happening in the deep south with the amount of lynchings that were going on and what Ida strived to do she's really the introduction of journalism she reported each and every lynching she um produced pamphlets and she distributed them around the country to expose the horrors um, of what was happening. And so, again, that's what we strive to do in the courtroom. We want to be in those courtrooms so we can expose what's really happening because we truly believe that injustice happens in empty in empty courtrooms. It's ripe for judges to just kind of have their way with people when there's no one looking at them. So again, one of the things that Harriet's Wildest Dreams does is you're present there in the court courtrooms often, correct? You're you're watching and and you're 
advocating um, for for justice when you sit in there. Is that is that right? That's absolutely correct. We are watching the courts right now, Joni, every day of the week, and um, it's because of this new this new legislation that council has passed down that expands pretrial detention. And we don't want any expansions of that because that just fuels our people into the into the carceral system. Um, so we watch arraignment court. Um, after you are arrested, the very first thing that happens is you have to be arraigned. Um, and then at that arraignment court, the judge decides whether or not they're going to hold you or re- or release you back into the community with your family so that you can build your case. Um, what counsel is seeking to do is to expand pretrial holds. They want more people to be held pretrial. Um, and so be, because of that, at Court Watch DC, we have this huge effort to collect as much data as possible so that we can see the impact of what's happening with this emergency legislation, and then um, use that to report back so that um, we can tell the council, hey, this thing is not really working the way that you intended it to. Even though we already have all of the data that shows that pretrial detention um, is already working as design, there are um, the the statistics from pretrial services say that less than 2% of people get rearrested on violent crimes when they're released pretrial and yet the answer um is counsel wants to increase pretrial detention which make it make sense that doesn't make sense to me i get you and um so I understand that you and and perhaps I know Nene Taylor was hoping to join us. We're having Nene them. is actually <laughs> right here with us, Joni. She's here in the room. Oh, oh, okay, great. So tell me. I know you both may have to jump off. Um, Frankie, do you are you? I am put Nene on now. <laughs> I think I think we can kind of popcorn right now, Joni. The hearing is actually having technical difficulties. We are both in the um, hearing room to testify in front of counsel as we speak, and they are having some tech difficulties. So I think we're good to stick around for for a while longer. Okay, terrific. And uh, tell us again. Uh, well, let me welcome. We, we're going to have our imaginary general, Bernini Taylor, who is definitely one of the key co-conductors for Harriet Wise's dream. I'm so proud of you, you sisters. Um, very, very inspiring. You know, in this world of ours, we have so many troubling things, to put it mildly, and discouraging things, but Harriet Wilder's dream is a shining star in our community. So we're very happy to have you, you both on this morning. So Nini, welcome. Hey, Joni, how are you? Thank you for having me. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Or as I say, black morning. <laughs> okay, we're so happy to have you. And um, maybe some of our other <clears throat> folks on the line will be able to answer questions as well. But uh, uh, tell us again, what is happening uh, at the city council today, this morning? Uh, well, actually, it's For a hearing. hearing. Oh, Frankie, you want me to get it or you... you? You, you got it. Yeah, so <laughs> I can hop in here. So right. there is there is a hearing this morning on um pieces of permanent let permanent laws um modeled after the emergency laws that they passed over the summer. Both Brooke Pinto, um the head of the Judiciary and Public Safety Committee and Mayor Bowser um put forth these bills that are supposed to keep us safer, that are supposed to um, make it so that people feel safe. And yet all these bills do is increase punitive measures. And so this morning we will we we are actually set up to testify um, at one of these hearings for the permanent legislation. Um, and we are the main tenant. What I want folks to take away from this whole thing is that De when you incarcerate people, that continues the cycle of harm. 
it does not interrupt that cycle. And we are pushing council to really focus on preventative measures and not ones that make us less safe. Detention is not prevention. We cannot incarcerate our way out of economic crisis. We can't incarcerate our way out of poverty. We can't incarcerate our way of any of the ills of capitalism. And yet council is doing just that. They want to expand all of the things that make us less safe. And then when people go to jail and come out, they're more disenfranchised. Um, So we want prevention. We don't want detention. Absolutely. And and Harriet's Wildest Dreams is is, uh, putting together a teach-in on this crime bill which we will be talking about definitely several times throughout this hour. It's going to be, I believe, Tuesday, September 26th. So that's a week from tomorrow. Because uh, Harriet's Rogers Dreams wants to really make sure that people understand what's happening with this so-called crime bill. And um, either Nini or Frankie, you can tell us, is there a particular focus on youth or, or how does this crime bill in, impact um, young people over the, I'd say under the age of 18? Uh, Frankie, I can jump in. Um, as some people may not know, um, or they may have heard that the DC government have actually set up hot spots for the youth with the youth curf- curf- curfew from um, Sunday through Thursday. They have to, between 11 and 6, they can't be, 11 p.m. and 6 in the morning, they can't be in the streets. And on Friday and Saturdays from midnight to 6 o'clock, um, youth are not allowed to be on the streets. Um, and they have set up several hot spots in D.C., which they feel like the youth more so hang out, which reality is, is they in every district, it's except for District 2, let's be clear, they don't have anything in District 2. <laughs> and we know why District 2 don't have any police and the surveillance of youth. Because I'm sure that white youth hang out, especially some of these kids at these um, universities, like at Georgetown and, uh, and American U and George, George GW. I can assure you they're not 18. They, maybe you may just hit 17. But my point is they're not policing in white neighborhoods where these youth, I know the youth are out. But um, they're targeting the youth and their goal is to take them to DYRS to actually um, ha- um, have caught a parent and a parent come pick them up. But the kids, if they was really trying to keep the youth sh- safe, why not take the youth home? Why put why take them into a place where their name is actually put into a criminal system? So right now and with the statistics, I've been trying to get the statistics because I know the first weekend that they've done it, only four youth was taken to DYRS. Right now, they haven't shared any more data around how many youth have been picked up since this curfew of policing our black youth and criminalizing them. Mm -hmm. Um, They they haven't shared any more data since the first weekend. Wow. And I understand, and you could correct me or fill us in that the mayor has cut a lot of the programs that were around even in recent years dealing with gun violence prevention and youth programs or or is that true or do you think that the mayor should be providing more resources for positive programs that can support the youth yeah and i would say that and i know that um I know that the dc recreation center is trying to do um do some things but reality is the money is not there to be actually expand it the way that they need to expand it. And so um, me being a DC native as well, I mean, I had so many activities that I can choose from that it's ridiculous, you know, but now, and some of the youth, you can't just make what you think the youth may want to do is the program for that youth. Right. Um, job opportunities. Mm-hmm. Um, this summer, her as wide as dreams. We actually had a fellowship where we literally, um, trained young young black girls from the ages of 13 to 17 to be organizers and be able to be a, a, a pillar in their communities to keep people safe. But the government, why can't the government offer something like that all year round? We don't have the resources to do that. But if they divest from cops and provide a service like that, they can, instead of doing 15 youth like we did, they can do 200 youth programs. But do they have those kind of programs? No. And reality is none of our youth this summer got into any any incident 
during the summer where we were we fit where we had activities and we kept them occupied where they were fine all summer. So why can't the government do something like that? We don't have the funding. They have government funding, but they've ever invested in 20 cops standing on U Street at night on a Friday night trying to see what youth may be out there after 12 midnight. Make it make sense. Yeah, and I just wanted to add on to that, Nini. Um, it costs six hundred dollars a day to incarcerate a youth at the youth services center. Six hundred dollars a day. That right. money can go. Would like to call to order this public hearing. Uh oh, that that money can go directly in into the pockets of youth who are disenfranchised instead of them investing money in things that are preventive again they are they are reactive and they're punitive in measure why are we spending six hundred dollars a day to keep kids locked up why are we locking kids up that's th that's the real question absolutely and of course we know those people who have been in dc for a while know that in the past when there was an increase in, in uh, homicides, et cetera. The city do, did do some things that really worked, but uh, we're not looking back and, and caring about what worked before. We're just doing things that it makes the problem worse, I believe. You are listening to Harriet's Wildest Dreams, two of the co-conductors, uh, Nene Taylor and Frankie. I'm sorry, Frankie, say your, your whole name again. Frankie C. Frank Frankie C. Braun. <laughs> Frankie C. Braun. And uh, they may need to jump off, hopefully both not at the same time, as they're waiting to testify at the city council today on this uh, crime bill. And um, let's let's talk. And I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, also ask either Chuck or McIver if you would like to ask a question real quick and then um, definitely um, at 10 30 we will be talking about the teach-in that Harriet's Wildest Dreams is doing on this crime bill uh, a week from tomorrow um, but Chuck or McIver if you have a question jump in now yeah I do if, if, uh -huh. welcome Chuck Thank you, Joni. I'm wondering, how do you get information out about the programs and projects that, you, that you're doing to our youth? Yeah, that's such a, that's such a great question. Um, so many different ways. Um, first and foremost, if you are not following us on Instagram and Twitter, we are at Harriet's Dreams on both of those platforms. Um, we have a pretty robust following on Instagram. And so we make sure to keep folks updated pretty much daily on things that are happening. Um, another way that folks can get tapped in, especially if you want to participate um, in the events that we have is to hit us up on Mobilize. And so our Mobilize is mobilize.us backslash hwd and i'll say that again it's mobilize.us backslash hwd and all of the events that we have coming up both virtually and in person will be on mobilizing ways for people to get tapped in some of the things that we have coming down the pipeline are actually this evening we're having um a black a black queer feminism training uh, a, a 101 where people can come and learn about gender identities, gender expression, um, especially as the country is rolling back rights for our um, trans folks. Um, so that that's that's tonight. Later this month, we will have a court watch DC training. If you want to get trained and learn how we hold actors accountable, learn what to watch for. Um, that is the place for you to be. And then finally, we have our teaching coming up um, September 26 on on Tuesday. If you want to know exactly what's going to be going into these bills, this proposed permanent legislation, that is the place to be so you can get the breakdown. And then folks can actually on that call write in and submit 
testimony um, because the window is still open. Um, and so we're hoping that as many people will show up so that we can really let, let the council know that like this is just not the way to go for DC. That's great. So you, uh, it's great to hear that your focus is on youth organizing. So often um, a lot of the, some of the activist groups don't, uh, are not that effective in reaching youth, but I'm, I know that you guys definitely are. Um, so let's talk a little more about this. February, I'm sorry, <laughs> September 26th, DC crime bill teach-in. Yeah. That's a week from tomorrow. Uh, and it's in the evening, I believe. Is that correct? At seven? Yes. It's at 7 p.m. And you can find us on Mobilize. Okay. So let's let's talk about why this, what people are going to learn if they attend this. And I'm definitely going to be attending it. Uh, I must say I've, I've attended a, a recent uh, teach-in that Harry's Wildest Dreams says extremely uh, helpful, very well done, interesting, important, et cetera. So I would recommend that everybody who's concerned about crime in DC uh, check out this teaching. So again, the crime bill was, this crime bill that you're going to be talking about was passed recently, correct? Or tell so, us a little bit about it. Yeah. So let me give you a, a little bit of background. So in, in, in the summer, the council passed what's called emergency legislation to uh, to address the violence that was happening in the city. E emergency legislation only lasts for 90 days. So that law will actually expire in one month on October 18th. Usually what happens is once an emergency bill is passed, that's indicative that they will probably try to then escalate and then pass a more long-term version of that bill. When there's an emergency bill, they don't have to hold a hearing. And so um, the folks who, two back in June, they galvanized, they went 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 to the council and talked about how any expansion of pretrial was not going to be great and some of the other things that they put in that bill just were not great for for residents what's going to happen now is that the that pinto has proposed what's called temporary legislation the temporary legislation lasts for 225 days which will give them enough time to then draft up and go through the full process of creating the permanent legislation. So there's three kind of steps. So a part of a part of what's going to happen at the teaching is we're going to talk about all three of those steps. We're going to talk about the process of of how bills bills get passed in DC uh, because we are not a state. <laughs> hands 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 off DC. Um, lots lots of things have to go through. Um, basically the Federal government has a lot of oversight over things, um, and our laws are are one of them. We saw home rule be repealed with the um, criminal code just a few months ago, and so um, council is, in my opinion, being very reactive and let, saying no matter what it looks like or what the impact is going to be, let's get these laws on the books so they can say we at least did something. But the something they are doing does not actually keep us safer. Um, I don't know if y'all have been looking at the media and the and the news, but things in D.C., um, especially with because we have to admit that there is actual harm happening in our communities. I'd be remiss if I said, oh, nothing's really happening. That's not, that's that's simply not true. There is actual harm being caused, but there is a difference between crime and harm. There's a huge difference. There are things that are criminalized that are not harmful. For instance, riding around with tents, that's criminalized, but who is that harming? And these, those, those are the types of quote unquote crime that give police more access to essentially 
over police our communities. Um, and so there's just this big hubbub in the media about what's happening in DC. And because of that, the council is being reactive and they're trying to get these tough on crime bills passed um, instead of getting at the root of the problem, Joni. Um, and the root of that problem is economic disparity in this city. The root of that problem oh, is mental health issues in our city. The root of the problem is DC is a city of have and have nots. And the have nots mm -hmm. is like, they just kind of want to kick you when you're down instead of investing. We are a resource rich city. Last fiscal year, I think we grossed $19 billion. And you're telling me that you don't have the money to invest in long-term preventative solutions that are actually going to help D.C. residents. I don't believe it. Absolutely. Let me say, you're listening to WPFW 89.3 FM. This is To Heal D.C. with me, Joni, and with Chuck, uh, healing ourselves, healing our communities, and healing our nation, which includes uh, fighting back and organizing around racism and things which move us backwards. We're so happy to have with us and thankful to have with us Harriet's Wildest Dreams, uh, named after, of course, the sister Harriet Tubman. And we have one of the co-conductors with us right now, Frankie Sabron, and um, hopefully Nene Taylor will be jumping back in. They are both testifying today, this morning, at, at in front of the D.C. City Council around this crime bill. So, um, Frankie, do you know, we, we're going to play a song right now, but if you have to leave soon, or can you hang with us for a while? I think I can or hang you with know. you for just a little while longer, Joni. <laughs> okay, let's just play a, a short clip, Mikey, uh, of the next, the next song, and we're going to also describe uh, about this this song, where it comes from, um, uh, <laughs> where are my notes? We'll you hear the song and you'll, we'll talk about it after we hear this, about 30 seconds of this great song. Sounds good. And we ready, we ready, we come, we ready, we come, we come, we ready. We come, we ready, we come, we come, we ready, we come, we ready, we ready, we come, we come, we ready, we come, we ready, we come, we ready, we ready, we come, we come, we ready, we come, we come, we ready, we ready, we come, we come, we ready, we come, we come, we ready. We ready, we coming, and that definitely describes uh, Harriet's wildest dreams. And Frankie, perhaps tell us, this This is one song that's part of the Freedom Futures Collective. Yes. And we, we heard, <laughs> so exciting. Tell our listeners, our Jazz and Justice listeners, what is the Freedom Fighters Collective? And, and oh we my heard goodness. a version. Okay. They <laughs> are the wonderful. Listen. Mm -hmm. The movement needs music, Joni. Our ancestors were not marching in silence. I assure you that. So when we are gearing up to go fight these oppressive systems, we got to be ready. We we have to be ready to go. And Freedom Futures Collective does just that. They take the essence of what of what it means to fight against white supremacy, to fight against the carceral state, and they package it in just this you know, this musical genius almost. Um, um, Andre um, is the the lead creative behind Freedom Futures and they 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 are just brilliant. When we did um, the boycott Nelly's block party, Andre was our official DJ, get us pumped to, you know, again, to just fight back. Um, our movements need a soundtrack and for HWD, that's the Freedom Futures Collective. Oh, it's so exciting. And again, this radio station is dedicated to jazz and justice. And jazz includes mostly all music and definitely the music that you're playing. It's, it's so inspiring. We hope to be featuring it more on uh, Freedom Fighters Collective. And of course, I heard Nini. We didn't get to that point in the song, but Nini chimed in. Um, we ready, we coming. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, uh, 
in honor of Harriet Tubman. And I'll just say real quickly, um, it's my mom's birthday uh, on Thursday. People who listen know that um, I talk about my mom every once in a while. She's a very present ancestor. And one of the first things that she taught me about when I was a baby was Harriet Tubman. <laughs> oh, that's she used to take us to the railroad site. So I'm very, uh, I guess it's in divine order that we're having you, Harriet's Wild Streams, on on this week. So um, let's keep rolling here because I know you might have to jump off. Um, and I know we have um, a new team member with us, um, McIver Kimon, uh, who is actually works with the um, labor, DC Labor Chorus. So she is also a singer and activist. Uh, if, if, McIver, if you want to jump on, um, with a question or comment, please Hi. do. Good morning. I actually, real quick, it's actually Kim and MacGyver. So yeah, and it's been great to hear from both you, uh, Frankie and Nini this morning. I just, a quick comment is just, I think a lot of people hear systematic change and don't understand how it can happen at the grass, grassroots level. And it's so wonderful to hear how you're making that change happen in a sustainable way, and actually focusing on what the community needs and listening to what the community's listening to and hearing and what they need and our own politicians aren't doing that. So I'm just very in awe of the work that you all are doing. So thank you for sharing this morning. Oh, thanks so much. Ha happy to be here, y'all, truly. <laughs> and Frankie, you guys might want to come up with that. I wouldn't say that the another word to describe what the city council is doing. I wouldn't say that they, they're being reactive. We need, we need, they're really moving us backwards. Uh, so it's, it's where they're moving us in a negative uh, direction. The city has in the past had much more progressive uh, responses to the increase in, in, in crime. And of course, you know, we know that those the people are being locked up are not the real criminals, but let's, let's, uh, or not the major criminals in this, in this city or country, but let's um, focus back on the upcoming uh, crime teaching, crime bill teaching. Um, so let's see. Um, what, again, it's going to be happening Tuesday, a week from tomorrow at 7 p.m. And tell us some of the things that the reasons why listeners should, should check this out and tune in. Yeah. Um, first and foremost, it's because um, it's really easy for whoever is creating legislation to tell you the narrative that they want you to know about it. It's really easy to like sneak things into bills without really knowing what the impact is going to be. And so our job, what what we've tasked ourselves with, and when when I say we, it's not just Harriet's Wild, Harriet's Wildest Dreams that's do, that's doing this work. We need um, the entire landscape to do this work. Um, and because of that, we've partnered with other organizations. We partner with D with DC Justice Lab, with Black Swan Academy, with Metro DC DSA, and with HIPS. Um, and so all of our- I'm sorry. Let's just talk real briefly about some of those groups because these are very fabulous groups in the community that listener may not know about. Um, Black Swan. Yes. Is so, what? Is a young... Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell us about each of them a little bit. Okay. So Black Swan Academy is focused on youth organizing and not in the sense where um, it's adults organizing youth, but it's the youth organizing other youth. Um, and they're completely youth, youth focused. They actually submitted a statement I believe the week before last about the curfew and how the cur the curfew is punitive and it directly targets um, our black youth in D.C. Um, and so they're doing really excellent work as far as the kids are involved. Um, amazing stuff happening there. Um, D.C. Justice Lab is a policy forward organization. Um, they have a platform called Safe and Free D.C. It's a policy platform, and it tells you all about the bills that are either have already been introduced or the ones who or the bills that have yet to be introduced that will actually um, 
do that. It'll make DC not only safe, but also free. There, There is a way that we can create laws that actually keep us safer and don't make things punitive. Um, and DC Justice Lab holds a lot of that work. They do excellent things. Um, we have wow. HIPS, um, which is... Um, HIPS does a lot of the decrim poverty work in DC, uh, holds a lot of the um, sex work um, and things, things like things, uh, especially when it comes to if you need, if you need to be trained on how to use Narcan, if you need to know what, what to do in order to use drugs safely. And they have a, um, a um, lens that really does not, that does, that seeks to decriminalize drugs. At some point, whether it is alcohol or whether it is um, weed, which is decriminalized in DC, we've all used drugs. And what they seek to do is teach people how to use drugs safely um, and not that it's it's something to be crim- to be criminalized for. Um, so lots of great. And um, mm-hmm. and let me just jump in and say, and Chuck probably remembers HIPS as well. I can remember when HIPS was first formed in the early 1990s, in the height, the height of the HIV epidemic, when um, sex workers, among others, were were dying, and there were no programs. But uh, HIPS jumped up, and at that point, we had a strong health department. <laughs> Uh, led by Reed Tuxton and other people that I work with. So I'm, I remember now it's, it's been 30 years and they're still out there on the front line. Uh, so these are the or, some of the organizations that are going to be working, that are working with Harriet's Wildest Dreams for this teach-in a week from Tuesday, September 26th, about the D.C. crime bill. Um, so this is obviously going to be a very, very important teach-in. Uh, so that people can understand that uh, the, the D.C. Council seems to have us moving backwards and doing things that are hurting more, the community more rather than helping. And we know if the community is hurt more, it's going to be more crime. Um, so this is obviously not the solution. Um, and again, there are solutions that people like Tyrone Parker and the Alliance for Concerned Men always talk about uh, that worked um, in, in the past. So we need to be looking at that too. Um, Dallin, anything else? You, yes, jump in, Chuck. Is there, is there an email that we could have uh, to give <laughs> more, more information? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Mm-hmm. If you'd like more information so, on things that we do, um, you can email general at harrietsdreams.org general at harrietsdreams.org thank you okay <laughs> and i know telephone is probably out of the question as these days but um i would urge people um again harriet's wildest dreams is a very very inspiring very very important very creative committed organization. So it's important for listeners to know about your work and follow what you do. Um, Anything else you'd like to say about the crime bill or the teach-in coming up on this September 26th? Yeah, I'd just like to encourage listeners to please get, get involved, even if you want to come to understand better what's happening in in these bills, even if there are parts of the bills that you agree with, it is okay. The best thing we can do is get educated around what's happening and not allow the camp, the council to just pass through things without our input. Um, this is their job is to represent the the needs of the people. And we are those people. So we kind of we have to band together, we have to drown out this this narrative really that says dc is violent dc is crime written dc is all those things and let folks know that there is really the root of all of this is harm is harm 
hurt people hurt other people. And to get the people to not hurt other people, we can't hurt them back. What we have to make is for people to heal. And punitive measures, increasing mass in incarceration, expanding pretrial holds is only going to serve to punish. It is not going to serve to help people. So please get involved, y'all. Follow HWD on Instagram. Go to mobilize.us backslash HWD um, and sign up to come to the teaching. You will learn a whole lot and hopefully be able to put some of that education and move it to power. Absolutely. And this radio show to Heal DC was founded many decades ago because we believe it should be a model, a model of what's right, a model of what works, not a model of what doesn't work. And I must say, uh, I'm in New York City for the few days here, and people are talking on the news in New York City is talking about the horrible violence in Washington, D.C. The crime rate in New York has actually gone down. Uh, so we we do not want to be the example of what's worse. We have the highest discrepancy in income, income disparities in yep. the country. We have the, yep. the yep. much higher rate of wealthy people versus poor people. And that's gone on for way too long. We should not. Well, it's interesting that in the capital of this country, uh, is is the is an example of what's wrong what we should not be doing the poverty rate is increasing the the food um deserts we I, i'm sorry to even say it we may lose our supermarkets and more seven and eight there's going to have to be a fight for that but we we need to be an example of what is right and that is what harriet swadis dreams is uh is all about um Anything, anything else we you want to share with us, Frankie? Probably Nini is not going to be able to come back. Uh, she's testifying, and you're about to testify. Or unless that um, uh, McIver or Chuck has another question. Otherwise, we will wrap up because we're just about done. <laughs> anyway, Chuck uh-huh. or McIver or Frankie. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, again, Harriet's Wildest Dreams is having this teach-in a week from tomorrow, September 26th. We encourage everybody to join in. And you can get more information at general at harrietsdreams.org. Uh, or you can also go to mobilize.us slash hwd. Uh, Harry's Wildest Dreams is a very, very important and inspiring uh, organization. And um, with that said, I think we're just about done. I got a call right at the beginning of, right I was, I was about to jump on this show, that this Friday there's another hearing at the D.C. City Council about the sale of the hospital um, <laughs> Oh, or I can't think about all these. This it's the Providence Hospital. Apparently, the city is ready to sell Providence Hospital for the grand sum of one dollar. And you know, there was a big movement to save Providence Hospital. There was a big movement to save DC General. Uh, we lost both of those fights, but apparently, there is a hearing on Friday, uh, and Lawrence Wheatley called me. Uh, to tell me about it. That's all the information I have is that there's Friday uh, a city council hearing to sell Providence Hospital for the sale of $1. Now, when we think about (laughs) who should be locked up, well, we actually don't really think people should be locked up, but this, this is a criminal. That's an example of a criminal act that does real harm to folks. Um, I want to thank everybody. Thank uh, Mike Nacelle. Okay, callers, welcome. Good morning, Joni. Jump Lawrence on Wheatley and, here. Yay, Lawrence. Yeah, so, this is Lawrence Wheatley. So tell yeah, us I, what's happening so on it's, Friday. It's not, the, it's not the city. Well, the city has to weigh in on it. It's sort of like a pro forma deal, but it's uh, 
It's uh, Providence Hospital is being considered to be sale, sold for one dollar to a developer, uh, and uh, there's going to be a hearing this Friday. It's online. It's uh, sponsored by the uh, State Health Planning and Development Agency, part of part of the city. And um, to get more information, let me give you a phone number uh, because you have Great. to register to to attend, and that number is two zero two four four two. Fifty-eight seventy-five. Let me repeat that at two zero two four four two five eight seven five. You have to call if if you want to testify, but you can call that number as well to register for the online hearing. Um, I can give you that uh, uh, email address. It's Dana. That's D A N as in Nancy A dot Mitch Mitchner. That's M I T C H E. N E R at DC dot gov. And that's to register for the information hearing and receive a link to the WebEx conferencing conferencing for this Friday, uh, September 22nd at 10 o'clock. Uh, it's an online hearing regarding mm-hmm. the sale of a uh, Providence hospital, a non what was usually used to be a nonprofit, uh, entity to a for-profit, uh, and- Yes, and again, the number to call is 202-442-5875. I recognize that number. I believe that's a D.C. Health Department number. Uh, And again, unfortunately, we don't seem to have a movement, a community movement, to to demand that that hospital stay there. We we tried. uh, We lost that battle, but the battles are still yet to come this Friday. Uh, Should the city be selling... Uh, a hospital <laughs> when we need more health care, not less, selling it for a dollar. So call to get on and find out more about it, 202-442-5875. Thank you much, Lawrence Wheatley, for being on this case and for making sure that we know about it. You can hear uh, Lawrence Wheatley is also a wonderful musician uh, at East, on the Eastern Shore, <laughs> not Eastern Shore, the uh, Eastern Market. On what is it's on Sundays, Lawrence, that you can be heard? Sunday afternoon, I believe. Okay, we're just about out of time. Uh, I want to also mention that in Cobra, uh, which was a historic or is an historic organization fighting for reparations, is having its anniversary this coming Saturday, September 23rd. And it's going to be a celebration, it's going to be a joyous, party to celebrate what Encobra has been able to do. Uh, we want to also remind you that we're heading into the summer, so spring, fall equinox. So we're changing into the fall. So give some thought to yourself during this period. And also, last but not least, next week, we are excited. We, uh, I'm going to say that Chuck is also thinking the same way I have been over these last few days. Um, and McIver hearing about the United Auto Workers, 150,000 workers going out on strike. This is a historic moment in our country. Next week, we're going to be talking with some family members who've had family in the UAW, including our own Elise Bryant, whose father worked at the uh, UAW plant for many, many decades. So we're going to be hearing from some of the children of auto workers and current auto workers. So stay tuned next week. Thank you, everybody. And we are going out again with a song with uh, from the Freedom Futures Collective. Check it out and stand tall for justice. We'll see you next week. Thank you, Mike Nacella. What's up?